Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Uh, we're going to take a, a look at another book, uh, the book of Nehemiah. And it starts uh, very interestingly, kind of at the, well, let's go to, to, to chapter 8 in the book of, uh, of uh, Nehemiah. And we'll start with verse 1. Ezra had been out collecting things from, uh, uh, collecting scrolls. He was kind of a getting things together. And evidently that reputation and the, and the children and the people were interested in, in what, he had, what he had found. So, when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of which Moses, which, had, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday, before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for the purpose. Now dropping down to verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people when he had opened it. All the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. And then it gives a list of names and, uh, and ends with, The Levites helped the people to understand the law, and the people stood in their place. So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all of the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept and when they heard the words of the law. They must have had one guilt trip put on them. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Here's a group of people who've come back. It's 80 years, more or less, after um, they were supposed to have returned to Jerusalem. So, so what, has after, what has happened here is that they were taken away to Babylon captivity and then they years. St stayed around a long time in Persia and so on and so forth. And, and a now a small number of them came back. A very small right. percentage of them came back. And so now they're, they're beginning to, to, now to they, come back to Jerusalem and, and reoccupy Jerusalem and hopefully going to make it like it once was. That's the goal. That's the goal. Now, what do we know about, you, you need to understand a little bit about the history. We've, we've touched on it a little bit. Here's the, the context very briefly. Ezra was the first one who was, at, he asked permission if he could go back to Jerusalem and help out there. He went back and he, he, he read, read Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah were originally one book. Now, you read from what we now call Nehemiah, but it was originally part of the mm -hmm. same book. 
In the first year that Cyrus of Persia was emperor, the Lord made what he had said to the prophet Jeremiah come true. He prompted Cyrus to issue the following command and sent it out in writing to be read aloud everywhere in his empire. And it gives permission for them to go back home. And a few did, only a very small percentage. And it goes on explaining that in chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3. Um, This is right after... Cyrus overran, of Persia overran Babylon. Babylon. Mm-hmm. So he allowed the Jews to go home. Yes. This would be around 536, 535 BC. Okay. Then about 50 years goes by, and we have the story of Esther. And another seven or eight, ten years go by, and we have the first events of the story of, of Ezra. So that's what's happened so far. And it's interesting because one of the reason why I'm I'm raising this is because back in Daniel chapter 8, it talks about, in chapter 9, I'm sorry, it talks about when these prophecies, some of these prophecies in Daniel are supposed to begin. And it says they're going to begin from the date when, when, God commands his children to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When did that happen? Well, the only historical information we have about this time period is in these two books. So we want to look here and see if we find any information that will be helpful in nailing that down. Okay? So... Uh, as he read, from what yeah. we read here, we have the people weeping and Ezra saying, no, don't weep. This is, this is a good thing. Okay. There's a, a Ministry of Healing has a comment. Gratitude, rejoicing, benevolence, trust in God's love and care. These are health's greatest safeguard. To the Israelites, they were to be the very keynote of life. So in later years, when the law of God was read in Jerusalem to the captives returned from Babylon, the people wept because of their transgressions. Gracious words were spoken. Okay. And I want to comment, I was going to comment about that later, but let's, since you brought it up, let me talk about it right now. What had happened, well, in terms of the people's understanding of the Bible, when they were in Babylonian captivity? They could no oh. longer understand the language that it was written, they, that they the Bible was written They were forced to speak Aramaic instead of Hebrew. Now, Aramaic is related to Hebrew, but they're, they're not the same language. So they were forced to speak Aramaic. So from the time of the Babylonian captivity on, down to the days of Jesus, even to modern times, the language that the Jews, well, I shouldn't say that, not quite true. Um, Modern times, they've resurrected the ancient language. But up to the times of Jesus, the language of of Judah was Aramaic, Mm -hmm. not Hebrew. So what happened here, this example you had, Ezra got up and he read something in Hebrew, and they didn't know what he was saying. And they couldn't read it themselves, so the knowledge of scriptures was just about gone. So what happened? They had people help them. God, Ezra would speak a section in, in Hebrew, and then these Levites would spread out among the people, and they would explain in Aramaic what is. What would we call that today? An explanation in a, in a new language. Um, Translator. A modern translation. This is the first evidence of a modern translation, and here it is right in the Bible. Now, they didn't write it down, but they're explaining in another language for the benefit of the people. We have a, here we have a modern language translation. So now, why wouldn't Ezra himself have read it in Hebrew and then translated it into the Aramaic? He could have. Aramaic. The, the, the names that Norm skipped over were quite a number of people, and the reason he didn't is because he would do that, and then he had these 15 or 20 people, and they could scatter out, they could do the translation, and then if someone had a question or whatever, they could deal with this person. I mean, you've got 20 different people trying to explain. It's better than having one person trying to explain. And, and another thing that, that compounded the problem, Norm said that Ezra was going around gathering these scrolls. Um, we have to remember that... Uh, you know, everything about the old kingdom, all the buildings were gone, all the material things were gone. There's scriptures and everything. All of that was basically scattered, yeah, scattered to the There's wind. And two, two things that we need to be really aware of here when we come to this story. One, 
um, Ezra, is, is we're talking about here, he came back here to Jerusalem and he said, you know, the only thing really that we have left that's really of significance is the Word of God that was given to us as a people. And so he was going around everybody. Do you have any scrolls? Do you have any scrolls? What happened? Did some, did, when, when your family left uh, uh, Jerusalem back in the time of the Nebuchadnezzar's conquest, did, did anybody bring any scrolls? And he gradually collected these things. And it turns out that Ezra was the first one to put together something like what we would call a Bible. It was what the Jews would call their Bible, the Tanakh, or what we would call the Old Testament. That's a miracle he, 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 he was put, able to get that stuff together. So did he go down into Egypt where a bunch of the Israelites, a bunch of the Jews were also, and get from there? We have no idea. He may have. It wasn't that far. So how much stuff do you think he put together? Is it is he it put together basically our Bible now? Our Old Testament. Or it's it? our Old Testament. Basically our Old Testament. Okay, but um, would would the what's collected be more than what we have in the Old Testament? Well, we don't. We, he didn't write down a list for us. We're not sure, but we 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 know it was approximately what's in our Old Testament. Okay, so it looks like. Um, this was a time when God's providence did filter out some things mm -hmm. and and leave things. So yeah, and it's very likely that Ezra was the one who wrote First and Second Chronicles, as well as Ezra and Nehemiah. So he probably wrote four books of the Bible. So Chronicles could have been a compilation of a lot of stuff. Yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. Let me read you a little bit about the background and the comments about Ezra and Nehemiah. These are, these are introductions from um, the Message Bible to these two books, which were originally one book. Co talking about the book of Ezra and Ezra himself, history had not treated the people of Israel well, and they were in decline. A superpower military machine, Babylon, had battered them and then, leaving their city and temple a mound of rubble, hauled them off into exile. And I can tell you that if you had a chance to go through Ezra and Nehemiah, you'd find out that there are actually times when they begged people to come back and live in Jerusalem because nobody, it, it was such a mess that nobody wanted to live there. Well, I mean, even, 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 among the, even among the Jews who'd come back to Judah, they didn't want to live in Jerusalem. So now, going back, now 128 years later, a few Jews back in Jerusalem had been trying to put the pieces back together decade after weary decade. But it was not going well at all. They were hanging on by their fingernails, and then Ezra arrived. This is an extreme case of a familiar story, repeated with variations in most centuries and in most places in the world. Men and women who find their basic identity in God as God reveals himself in Israel and Messiah don't find an easy time of it. They never have. They never will. Their identity is under constant challenge and threat, sometimes by hostile assault, at other times by subtle and smiling seductions. Whether by assault or seduction, the people of God have come perilously close to obliteration several times. We are never out of danger. Because of Ezra, Israel made it through. God didn't leave Ezra to do this single-handedly. He gave him substantial and critical help in the rescue operation in the person of Nehemiah, whose work providentially converged with his. Important details of the Ezra story, as we've already noted, are in the memoirs of Nehemiah, the book that follows this one. The people of God identity was, reco was recovered and preserved. Ezra used worship and text to do it. Ezra engaged them in the worship of God, the most all-absorbing, all comprehensive act in which men and women can engage. This is how our God-formed identities become most deeply embedded in us. And Ezra let them, led them into an obedient listening to the text of Scripture. Listening and following God's revelation are the primary ways in which we keep attentively obedient to the living presence of God among us. Ezra made his mark. Worship and text continue to be foundational for recovering and maintaining identity as the people of God. And moving on into Nehemiah, separating life into distinct categories of sacred and secular damages sometimes irreparably any attempt to live a whole and satisfying life, a coherent life with meaning and purpose, a life lived 
to the glory of God. Nevertheless, the practice is widespread. But where did all these people come up with the habit of separating themselves and the world around them into these two camps? It surely wasn't from the Bible. The Holy Scriptures from the beginning to end strenuously resist such a separation. The damage to life is most obvious when the separation is applied to daily work. It is common for us to refer to the work of pastors and priests and missionaries as sacred, and that of lawyers, farmers, and engineers as secular. It is also wrong. Work by its very nature is holy. The biblical story is dominated by people who have jobs in gardening, shepherding, the military, politics, carpentry, tent making, homemaking, fishing, and more. Nehemiah is one of these. He started out as a government worker in the employ of a foreign king. Then he became, and this is the work he tells us in, of in these memoirs, a building contractor called in to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. His co-worker Ezra was a scholar and teacher working with the scriptures. Nehemiah worked with stones and mortar. The stories of the two men are interwoven in a seamless fabric of vocational hol holiness. Neither job was more or less important or holy than the other. Nehemiah needed Ezra and Ezra needed Nehemiah. God's people needed the work of both of them. We still do. So that'll just give you a little overview of the situation. Now, let's, let's look back here. We said already that we're 130 years more or less after the Babylonian captivity. I mean, after they went into Babylonian captivity. And here we are. And every time the children of Israel have tried to do something, we'll go into all the details. You can read it in the first, well, well, you can read it elsewhere. I won't go into all the details. But every time they tried to do something, what happened? What did the nations around them do? They tried to, try to tear it down. They set it on fire. They tried to tear it down. Every time they would try to do something, there were enemies around them. And when they tried to get permission from the king to do something, what happened? The enemies would write a, get the letter to write a king to tell them to stop building. And it just went on like this, and it, it was getting very discouraging. Very, very discouraging. And then what happened? Ezra showed up. <laughs> Ezra showed up with a letter. Okay? And if we had time, um, well, well, we'll look at some, maybe a some piece of that letter a little bit later. But um, it's a very interesting part of the opposition that I want us to look at. Look at Ezra chapter 4. And let's, uh, let's start with verse 11. And it's interesting that this is one of the few books in the Bible that goes back and forth between Hebrew and Aramaic. Why do you suppose it does that? Well, part of the letters were written in Aramaic, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So they just included the letter in its original form. Yeah. The decree, the letter we're going to read right now is in Aramaic because it came from the king, from the emperor. See? Okay, to Emperor Artaxerxes from his servant, actually it was addressed to him, from his servants who live in the west of Euphrates. So here's Israel's enemies talking about what Ezra is trying to do, okay? We want your majesty to know that the Jews who came here from your other territories have settled in Jerusalem and are rebuilding that evil and rebellious city. What are they doing? rebuilding that evil and rebellious city. They have begun to rebuild the walls and will soon finish them. Your Majesty, if this city is rebuilt and its walls are completed, the people will stop paying taxes and your royal revenues will decrease. And it goes on to tell them all the awful things that are going to happen if Jerusalem is rebuilt. But that suggests that Ezra was trying to do what? He's trying to rebuild the walls, right? Now the temple was rebuilt by Ezra I'm sorry, by Haggai and Zechariah about 50 years earlier. They got, they rallied the people around, so this small temple was built. So the temple's built, but there's still no walls around the city, okay? So Ezra is trying to get them organized to build walls, and every time they try to do something, the enemies attack it and destroy it. This is no small enterprise either to build this these walls. This no, is no small enterprise. So if we now turn to chapter 7 in Ezra. We're going to, we're going to read something, and I'm, I'm following this through because I, I want to make the point that I made earlier about the book of Daniel. 
Uh, many years later, when Artaxerxes was emperor of Persia, there was a man named Ezra, and it tells his story um, and down in verse 6 and 7. In the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes, Ezra set out from Babylonia for Jerusalem with a group of Israelites, which included priests, Levites, temple musicians, temple guards, workers. They left Babylon, Babylonia on the first day of the first month, and with God's help, they arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. And that turns out to be, and you might wonder how we know this. I'll tell you how we know this. They're actually, in ancient times, two different systems that were based on, on events that happen in the sky, based on star events. The Egyptians had one system, and the Babylonians had a different system, and the Medo-Persians followed that system. And, when you can, and the people, in down, the Jews, down living on an island in the Nile River down in Egypt, wrote some letters back and forth from down there to, to the king over in, in, in Media Persia, and when they did, they said, oh, such and such a date according to the Egyptian system, and such and such a date according to the Babylonian system, we did thus and so. And so it's possible, using those two different, uh, um, basically, things based on movements of stars and so forth, to nail this down exactly. So we can say that uh, this, this happened between the months of April and August of 457 B.C., okay? What we would call now, for they didn't know anything about 4 B.C., that kind of stuff, but according to our timing, the way we count back now, 457 B.C. And what did Artaxerxes tell um, Ezra that he could do? Well, I won't go into, I obviously don't have time to read the whole book, but look down at chapter 7, verse 17. You are to spend this money, he sends Ezra with a lot of money, you are to spend this money carefully and buy bulls, rams, lambs, grain, and wine, and offer them on the altar of the temple in Jerusalem. In other words, go back to your God, offer all these sacrifices for the king. He's saying, I need a blessing, I need yeah, all I the need blessing, it, yeah. all the blessing I can get, please go back there and pray to your God for me, right? But that's not all he said. He goes on in verse 18, You may use the silver and gold that is left over for whatever you and your people desire in accordance with the will of your God. Now, what do you suppose your people would desire? Walls. Walls. Mm -hmm. To protect them from the enemy that are attacking them every time they try to do something, right? Well, what happened as a result of all that? They built them. And someone else shows up on the scene, and who is it? The second hero in our story, a man by the name of Nehemiah, right? And he comes over there, and he says, he, what actually happened was that Nehemiah's cousin, a cousin, cousin or brother, I don't remember for sure, had gone from Jerusalem, gone back to, all the way to Shushan, had reported to Nehemiah, the awful things that were happening and how the walls were being torn down. And Nehemiah was very sad about what he'd heard. And the king, the emperor, actually said, how come you're so sad? And Nehemiah prayed to God instantly, just very quickly. And then he said to the king, he says, terrible things are happening in my home city in, in Jerusalem. And, and something needs to be done about it. And the king says, well, what do you think should be done about it? He says, well, if you'll give me permission, I'll go and see what I can do. And so the king gave him money and permission, and off he went. And um, I won't go into all the details, but you can read about it in chapters in Nehemiah, chapter 1, 2, and 3. And it talks about all the different people who worked in different places in, in the wall. And they had all organized themselves, and they had to, it came down to the place their enemies were so working so hard against them that they had to carry a sword in one hand and a hammer in the other one, basically, until they rebuilt this wall. And it turns out that in 52 days, they had the wall finished and completed, and the Jerusalem was protected more or less from its enemies. Now, how, how big around what was the perimeter of this thing here? Pretty, quite a distance. And that's the next question I want to ask you. How did they get all that work done in 52 days? Because right. it's not like they had the bulldozers. And no. this is, no. this is a, a primitive... Do Earthen and rock wall. Do it by hand. And not just six inches wide. It's no. This wall is so big that later on they marched on top of that. Whole choirs and, and orchestra, not orchestra, choirs, marched around on top of this wall celebrating. 
Much of that wall had been built before, portions of okay. the wall, sections here and there. This is the important point. Right, Huge breaches. sections of this all, yes. the wall had already been built, but there were these big gaps, and so there was no way to, so long as there's gaps, you can't protect yourself. Right. So in the 52 days that Nehemiah organized things, they closed those gaps until it was one solid wall. And that's, that's what was accomplished by Ezra and Nehemiah. Now we want to, we want to, and the reason that's important because, is because the prophecy in Daniel, 5, in Daniel 9, maybe we should take just a second and look at that. Look at Daniel 9, and we're coming down to um, verse 25. Note this and understand it. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until God's chosen leader comes, seven times seven years will pass, and, and so forth. Um, so they're using Daniel. God is using that date in biblical prophecy with Daniel to initiate a time beginning when to start calculating those saying, prophecies. Yes, calculate those prophecies. And this story in, in, uh, Nehemiah, yeah, in Nehemiah and Ezra is helping us to pinpoint when that mysterious date is. Yes. And why is that important? What prophecies are dated from that point? Well, one is uh, 70 one is weeks. The 2300 day prophecy and the 70 week prophecy. The 70 week prophecy goes up until up to the anointing of Jesus at his baptism and carries through to his crucifixion in the middle of the week and then to the time when Stephen was stoned and the gospel went to the Gentiles, that the Christians were scattered at the end of that week, at the end of the 70-week prophecy. And just as it prophesied there in Daniel, this is the time that was set, up, was, was set apart for God's people. And if you come down to uh, AD 34, the time when um, the period for the Jews was ended, and you subtract 70 weeks or 490 years from your 2300 years, you end up with 1810 left, and you add that to 1830 to, to 34, and you come up with 1844, which is of course a famous date for Adventists because it was the time of what we call the Great Disappointment. We don't want to go there now, but it's the books of Ezra and Nehemiah that give us the starting date for that prophecy. Okay, so now. Um, there's a lot more things we need to talk about in, in Ezra and Nehemiah, but I think that was an important thing. What were some of the other major events that happened in, in, in Ezra and Nehemiah? What did, what did Ezra and Nehemiah, especially Ezra, find out when he went back to Jerusalem for the first time? What was going on back there? Remember? The Jewish men had non-Jewish wives. A lot of them. And was that all? They had children that didn't even know the language. They had children that didn't even know how to speak Hebrew. They were rapidly becoming just as bad as the people that had gone into Babylonian captivity 130 years earlier. It, it's and, like nothing has changed. And, and what, how did they accomplish that? I mean, what, what was going on that, that made them accomplish that is they were just becoming like the people around them. It was so, they were so attracted by the things that the people around them were doing that they just seemed to, it seemed to be un unable to, to avoid it. And we're going to talk some, a lot more about that, but right now we need to take a break, so don't go away.
Welcome back. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're going to look at some of the other details in Ezra and Nehemiah that raise questions. Now, remember, we, we point out the general principle that these books happen late enough in history so that a lot of the details can be documented from extra biblical sources. And it turns out that everything that can be documented is valid. So that raises, I hope, raises your trust in the Bible. And if you're not sure about that, get, a, get yourself a good, reliable, conservative commentary, and most of those details will be in there. We mentioned just as we were concluding our second half that unfortunately, if you're looking, let, let, let's go back to Ezra 9 and 10 now, and notice what was happening when Ezra arrived back in Jerusalem is, is trying to get things going. I'm going to start with the first verses of, of Ezra 9. After all this had been done, some of the leaders of the people of Israel came and told me that the people, the priests and the Levites, had not kept themselves separate from the people in the neighboring countries of Ammon, Moab, and Egypt, or from the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Amorites. They were doing the same disgusting things which these people did. Do those names sound vaguely familiar to you? Yes. Those Where did you hear them before? Those are the same names that were present in the land of, in the Promised Land when, when Israel came out of Egypt. And what was supposed to happen to them? They were supposed to be driven out. Driven out or wiped out, right? Here they are, still here, and what's happening? They're still causing trouble, right? Causing lots of trouble. They were do anyway, Jewish men were marrying foreign women, and so God's holy people had been contaminated. The leaders and officials were the chief offenders. When I heard this, I tore my clothes in despair, tore my hair and my beard, and sat down crushed with grief. I sat there grieving until the time for the evening sacrifice to be offered, and people were frightened. I'm, I'm sorry, and people began to gather around me, all those who were frightened because of what the God of Israel had said about the sins of those who had returned from exile. Why, uh, why was he so amazed at this? I mean, the, the people left behind had been left, their culture had been destroyed, they didn't have the anchor of their scriptures, they didn't have their temple. It would just be a natural consequence, it seems like. They had nothing, there was no guide, no light, no anchor. Ezra was doing everything he could to try to put that scriptures together. So wasn't this the, the 50,000 or so that left at the end of 70 years? These left were the Babylonian saints. captivity to go back to Jerusalem and surrounding These communities. were the ones who had at least enough faith in God that they went back home. And in 70 or 80 years, they deteriorated to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And another comment, and, and it, they, they tried to straighten everything out. If you, if you read on through chapters 9 and 10, I won't actually... Um, Look at chapter 10, verse 7, just to get an idea of what they did. A message was sent throughout Jerusalem and Judah that all those who had returned from exile were to meet in Jerusalem by order of the leaders of the people. If any failed to come within three days, all their property would be confiscated and they would lose their right to be members of the community. How does that sound? Does that sound a little dictatorial? Yes. Within the three days, on this 20th day of the ninth month, all the men living in the territory of Judah and Benjamin came to Jerusalem and assembled in the temple square. It was raining hard, and because of the weather and the importance of the meeting, everyone was trembling. Ezra the priest stood up and spoke to them. He said, You have been faithless and have brought guilt on Israel by marrying foreign women. Now then, confess your sins to the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do what pleases him. Separate yourselves from the foreigners living in our land and get rid of your foreign wives. The people shouted in answer, We will do whatever you say. Does that sound familiar? Just like Sinai. Just like Sinai. All that the Lord has said, we will do, right? Well, you got to admit they were a little different because before Babylon, they, um, when, when a prophet told them they were doing something wrong, and go, eh. But now they're shivering and shaking in their boots. So there is a well, little difference there. Probably because it's cold and it's raining. Yeah. <laughs> well, it said they were trembling. Well, it so. goes on. It says, but they, but they added, the crowd is too big and it's raining hard. We can't stand here in the open like this. This isn't something that can be done in one or two days because so many of us are involved in this sin. 
Let our officials stay in Jerusalem and take charge of the matter. Then let anyone who has a foreign wife come at a set time together with the leaders and the judges of his city, and this way God's anger over this situation will be turned away. No one was opposed to the plan except Jonathan, son of Asahel, and uh, Je Jeziah, son of Tikva, who had the support of Meshelam and of Shabbatai, a Levite. The returned exiles accepted the plan, so Ezra the priest appointed men from among the heads of the clans and recorded their names and so forth. And they set about very carefully, meticulously, one by one, going through these names. What does that suggest to you? Were they, does, does this look like they're just sort of whole Sarah paying no attention? You go, get rid of you. No, no, no. This is organized. And how do you suppose they would decide who to keep and who to, to kick out? Um, they had kind of a bloodline, didn't they, that they were looking at? Oh, maybe. I don't know if there was a Ruth involved or not. Okay. Well, it turns out that many of these children who were born to these couples could not even speak Aramaic. They spoke the language of the nations around them. What does that tell you? They're normal kids. <laughs> well, yes and, they, and no. And they took on the culture of the Just nations exactly around what you'd expect them to do. The if, well, but so. think about this for a moment. Kids learn, I have a granddaughter who's five and a half months old right now. Her mother is speaking French to her and her father is speaking English to her. And that child would grow up speaking fluent French and fluent English. Why? Because that's what she's exposed to. These kids could not speak Aramaic. Why not? their parents couldn't. <laughs> because either their parents couldn't or didn't, or they were not around other children or other families who did. In other words, what, were, what was being done to preserve the culture and the religion and the language of Israel? Nothing. Nothing. So okay. what do you do in a case like that? Maybe they had given up. Maybe so. Does that mean that they should be, they were an essential part of the Jewish people? Not at all. They had already made up their minds that they didn't want to have, you know, they weren't, they weren't part of the Jewish people. And, and Nebuchadnezzar, when he came originally and hauled all the, a lot of people off, he didn't carry off the halt and the lame. He took the brightest. Mm -hmm. So the ones that were left behind um, yeah, but it showed, so bright. it showed what they thought was important. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was kind of an effect. You could, you know, you can see the people... You can divide them up if, if a person, if this group of people actually reads the Bible and this group doesn't read the Bible, you know, you know where their priorities are. And not knowing the, the language is just showing them that, that their priority was not going, you know, to, to God and what was in the past and what they should have learned. So, Okay, now obviously we're not just discussing all this history just because it's fun to talk about it. What does this imply about what kind of progress God is making? Sounds like he's not making much progress. It sounds like at the very best we're back at the foot of Sinai, right? That was a thousand years before this happened. A thousand years. And we're sort of back to where we were. History repeats itself, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so so are you saying that the best... All over again? <laughs> Are you, are you saying that God's a failure, or is God trying to make a... You, I'm saying, what does it look like? Let's be honest with the book. Well, um, it, it could be all kinds of things. Okay. God could be a failure, or God is trying to tell you something else, too. You know, there could be another thing. God is ever forgiving, kind, mm -hmm. patient, loving, I, like we were talking about the book of Hosea. The other but, day. but how far can he take that? I mean, he could be patient, loving, clear to eternity, and never do anything about sin either. Well, here so. we are. We're in 2012 now, and Jesus died on the cross. I mean, we've almost, made almost some 2,000 progress, years ago. But. Yeah, and we've had ebbs and flows in the spiritual uh, experience of of humankind since that time. So we have the Dark Ages and. And we have a resurgence of um, um, spiritual renewal, and okay. So, what what do we what you know? 
Keeps is that just a is that just a human pattern like we, we discussed before? Is that just it's just going to you take humans and that's what's going to happen? Okay, let's let's take this is an attempt to take a bird's eye view of things. Uh, next time, probably, or next in, within the next couple of weeks, anyway, we'll get down to the place where we're talking about the period between the testaments, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But now these are this, the only thing that happens after Ezra and Nehemiah is the little tiny book of Malachi. Okay? That's the last of the Old Testament. Okay? So now we're trying to wrap things up here. Does God look like he's winning? Now, uh, let, me, let me just give an example. Some of you have had the privilege once or twice, perhaps, I hope, all of you once or twice maybe, of going to what we call the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. It happens every five years. And we go there to sort of see what's going on, what progress the church is making, etc. What kind of things get reported? Good things. Like what? How many <clears throat> converts we've had. How many people have we converted? What else? Tithes and offerings. How money. much money we have raised? What else? How many new churches served? How many new churches have been built? All the statistics. All the great things that we've accomplished, right? <laughs> if God were giving a report at the end of Ezra and Nehemiah, what would he say? English. Statistics are not too good here. <laughs> the, back, the counting of the backslidings for the, the generations. The counting of the backslidings? Well, seriously, I mean, this is what the Bible is all about. Now, what are we going to do with it? Yeah, well, the... Are the, st the statistics aren't the issue. I mean, these people were so saying... So you're saying that we shouldn't be reporting the statistics at the general conference? There might be some truth that ought to be talked about there that isn't. Okay. <coughs> like? Uh, Problems? We have a whole host of things going on in our big tent church that look more like this. More like Ezra and Nehemiah? <laughs> more like Ezra and Nehemiah than anything else. Now you're trying to scare me. That's not, not what either. comes from the podium of the GC. That's what I'm saying. Maybe they ought to talk about something else. Well, they do, but those are, as I understand it, I've never been there, but those things occur in the rooms beyond the big room. But if, we're going, <laughs> if, if we are anticipating that we are going to finish the three angels' messages to the world and get out of this, off of this ball of mud, we're going to have to do something different than these people did. Well, and that's what Ezra and Nehemiah are coming in here is to, we need to do something different. And they were able to do something different. Yes. But then after another generation comes along and they're right back at it. Mm -hmm. Maybe what we need is, we maybe we're ready for another rebirth and another generation can come along and they can have a rebirth and a revitalization and then pretty soon after 50 years they're back in the same well, situation. Well, the problem is you could take this cycle and say it's going to go on forever. Mm -hmm. But it didn't go on forever with Jerusalem. They ended up having Jerusalem destroyed. Is that where we're headed? We're headed for Jerusalem being destroyed. Oh boy. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Instead of telling these guys to get rid of their foreign wives and maybe, they, maybe the men went with them, well, we don't know, why didn't Ezra and Nehemiah have a giant evangelistic campaign? Wouldn't that have been a better solution? Well, oh, you mean to, to bring the wives in? Sure. And the children. And the children. Uh, Was this the right thing that they you did? You can't... I'm asking you. you I ask. You'd have to have a big nurturing you could, party for a while, long time to get these guys these to turn around. These people were adults. They were ingrained in their religions. But we and go out and we hold evangelistic campaigns for adults all the time. Well, that's only if you <laughs> want to get the numbers in. Some, you know, it's almost like... The church sometimes seems like a franchise, doesn't it? I mean, you just get the numbers in, you make more money, you get you get you pat it on the back because you get more converts. But is anybody really being saved? You know, that's another question. We reach people who want to change. These people did not want to change. That's mm -hmm. right. That's good. Okay. 
Well, what did happen by, as a result of Ezra and Nehemiah's work? They started keeping the Sabbath. Okay, let's talk about that. What did Nehemiah do? Didn't he lock he, he the gates? He locked the city gates and kept now the Now that he has a wall, now that he has a wall around the city, he finds out the people are coming in and trying to sell their fish, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, on the Sabbath. And what did he do? Sunday law. He right. said, you guys, stay, <laughs> you guys stay out of here. And the next Sabbath they were back, and so he started pulling hair out of their beards and out of their heads and said, if you guys don't come out, don't, if you try to come back here, I'm going to lock the gates and I'm going to pull more hair out of your hair, more hair out of your head and your beards. And what happened? They stayed out until sunset. They stayed out until sunset, which is what he intended for them to do. That's what we need, more discipline like that. Maybe that would get everybody going. Well, but then let's go on with the story. Okay, go on with as, the story. As they, <laughs> as, they, as they developed this business of making rules to make sure that the population kept, kept Sabbath and all this, uh, that process continued on, and, and finally it became that the, that the rules and the regulations that they were making to protect the Sabbath became more of a mechanism of salvation than the God that they were supposed to be worshiping, and they went in the other ditch. So Ezra was the first of the scribes, and he did us a tremendous service because he put together yeah. what we would basically call the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But he, he trained others to copy the Bible, to do their work, which is all a wonderful thing. But what happened is the ones that he picked to do that were, the, of course, the educated ones, and pretty soon they began to feel like they were the ones who, it was their job to tell other people what to do, because after all, they were the scholars, right? Yeah. And over a period of the next three or four hundred years, they morphed into what we call in New Testament times the Pharisees, Pharisees and the scribes. So are you saying that they started worshiping scholarship instead of God? Well, yes, I am. Basically. Well, what was the, what would have been the never do that again? Yeah. What what would have been the better plan, though? It looks like we had to go through that, because well, that's what Jesus had to run into. The okay, now let's let's look back. Let's just remember where we came from. What was the what were the great sins of the children of Israel just before the Babylonian captivity? Worshiping idols. Worshiping idols. They had idols in the temple. Mm -hmm. Etc. They didn't fear God. Anymore, worshiping right? the stars, they didn't fear God. What else were they doing? They were abusing the poor and the widows. Okay, and, and what orphans. else were they doing? Outside of the temple. In fact, over in the hills. Worshiping well, the fertility the, cult centers. The fertility cult centers, they were busy. Yeah. What happened after Ezra and Nehemiah did their thing? There's no more fertility cult worship. No more idols, no more fertility cult worship. What else? They started making rules about keeping the Sabbath. So they started doing the right things for the wrong reason. And what we have is all of a sudden, and how did they do that? We have a culture that went from the fertility cult religions right across the road and into the ditch on the other side. Yeah. Which, which of those ditches is, is, is most savable? Well, neither one. <laughs> Let you me read you. You almost have to go into those ditches no. to find out about them. No. I well, mean, yeah. yeah I mean, well, maybe. How else could you do that? If, if, okay, you got a problem. You know you have a problem. Okay, this is a solution. Let's try the solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they try the solution. They go to the other side of the ditch, you know. But now we know that that wasn't the solution, so there's got to be something else. It was let, Jesus when he came. Let me, right. let, let me read what Jesus said about the difference. Then Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon. Why are Tyre and Sidon important? They were completely destroyed. They were rebellious. They thought that not they were only so that, wonderful. What else do we pagan know? Cities. They were pagan cities. What else do we know? That, those were the headquarters for Baal worship. Mm -hmm. Those were the headquarters for Baal. They're the headquarters for the fertility cult religions, okay? If the miracles that performed you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you that it would be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, 
Will you, be le- uh, will you be lifted up to the skies? No, you will go down to the depths. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom, it would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Yeah, Where were you reading? I was reading Matthew 11, 20 through 24. Well, the question is, why didn't he do that then? Well... I mean, good question. Because, well, because he's got, a, he's got an eternity that needs to be fulfilled. Mm-hmm. He's got a, you know, things have to be demonstrated so that we can look back so, on this. Exactly. So what so, is being demonstrated? Things are just as bad in both ditches. Right. In fact, the ditch with the Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, health-reforming, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Pharisees and scribes. There's less hope for that ditch than there is in the other one. That's what Paul says in Romans 1, 2, and 3, isn't it? Yeah. And, of course, we're more like which group? Uh, we're the ones that have had the light even beyond them. And where are we? Well, we're more like the Well, I'm, recent a, I'm afraid we're... Keeping health reforming. Deep in the ditch. We're here at this table trying to enlighten the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we, we chuckle, but this is serious stuff. We, we need to think about where we are and where we're, where we're going with all of this. I, I, the, the Bible isn't here just for entertainment, uh, clearly. Um, well, it says that, that God's people... If they, if they stand out for him, they're going to look different than the world and they're going to be persecuted. Mm-hmm. Where's any persecution going on? Paul says, here. Paul says anybody who's faithfully keeping the faith will suffer persecution. So if we're not suffering persecution, put the formula backwards. We're probably not keeping the faith. Mm. Well, you can't take it too far because well, Jerusalem no, was destroyed afterwards and it was they didn't really change is it possible is it possible that the jews were so weak and so feeble in their service of god that they literally could not survive spiritually in the presence of these idolaters that's exactly right do you have a verse for that overwhelmed i mean do you have a verse for that i I just have history can you just have history (laughs) can you can you find somebody that could stand that I mean, well, let me read you the verse that's in the Bible. Thir- Nehemiah 13, 26. I told them, this is now Ezra speaking, or no, I'm sorry, this is Nehemiah speaking. I told them it was foreign women that made King Solomon sin. Here was a man who was greater than any of the kings of other nations. God loved him and made him king over all of Israel, and yet he fell into this sin. He's talking about marrying foreign women. Are we then to follow your example and disobey our God by marrying foreign women? And he goes on to explain. And so- Solomon, that, that's, that was the beginning of the downfall of the kingdoms, wasn't it? After Solomon, what happened? The north and the south split, and they split over all of Solomon's misbehaviors, right? You certainly wouldn't want to marry somebody like Ruth. <laughs> yeah, right. So now let's, let's be very serious here in the last four minutes we have. What do you think the universe looking on thought of the events that were going on in Ezra and Nehemiah? They said, yes, we're finally going to have a demonstration of God's people. Okay. No, they were thinking, oh, here we go again. We'll have a little upsurge and we're going to go down again. These humans down there, there's just no why, hope. Why do we think these angels are so conservative? <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe they are per- perplexed. You know, they they're they're also just perplexed. Well, they they, they want to see the answer seen too. The history for several hundred years: idols, 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 and now they're getting away from idols. That's got to be progress. Mm-hmm. Seems like it, doesn't it? Yeah. If you had been, if you had been there, and you've been, let's say, in the place of Ezra, what would you have done? <laughs> you know, looking at the but, past, I'd probably do the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to I mean, that would be the next thing. With them. Yeah. I mean, we don't have the history going the other way where you have all these neat rules and everybody, you know, concentrating on these rules. Mm-hmm. So that might be a good thing to try out. And but, they did. But it, as, as Gordon mm-hmm. says, if we're supposed to learn from somebody else's mistakes, well, here's some mistakes to look at and learn from. Uh-huh. 
But well, he, he was. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah were dealing with children again, mm -hmm. just like at Sinai. He had to give them rules: don't kill your neighbors, don't steal from them, and so don't here, marry them. yeah, and so here, Ezra and Nehemiah were saying. You know, this is what we do on the Sabbath. This is a starting place. This is not the end. This is where we start. This is and the starting then, place. The rules. <laughs> and then you learn to be a friend of God. Okay. So what have we learned about God from Ezra and Nehemiah? God is here, and God has the foreknowledge. He knows what's coming, right? He knows that these people are going to end up crucifying his son. 400 years, more or less, down the line. Why does he bother with all of this? He's Doesn't it seem a little keep, futile? He, he's got to keep the people together because his, his real demonstration is yet to come. Okay. Well, why, how can he answer questions unless he goes through all this stuff? I mean... What do you want him to do? Say, sit down here for a minute, I'll tell you about 3,000 words and that should satisfy you. No, you've got to go through things actually happening where people can look at it from their angles and everything to answer their questions. Let me, let me, let me make a suggestion in the last minute we've got. In the great controversy, we have two sides. We have God's side, we have Satan's side. Don't both sides of this controversy need to be demonstrated? Yes. Don't we need to see the consequences of what happens if you follow both sides? Yeah. We need to see these events. We need to see what happens if you do make all the wrong choices. That's part of, it's possible that the Jews were chosen in ancient times, not because they were a bunch of saints, but because God knew in advance that they would make all the necessary mistakes on both sides so we could have a record to learn from. What have we learned? Have we really looked at this? I mean, we're not marrying foreign women. We just bring them into our living room on the television, right? We're not doing any of these kinds of things, but we're spending all our time doing things that maybe we shouldn't be doing. What are the chances that we're going to finish the gospel any more than these people did in those times? And that's the question I'm leaving with you.